It's good to be here. Quincy is on retreat and I am grateful to him and honored that he has entrusted his pulpit to me. I'll begin with a confession. I would have made a lousy Jew. They had 613 rules by which they had to abide. You can ask my parents how well I would have probably done. But I do hold a fascination with the laws of the Torah. We are quickly approaching now the season of its stewardship. And I am a widow. I say that because law number 532 of the 613 says, thou shalt not take the pledge of a widow. <laughs> I've been trying that with the stewardship committee for 11 years and it hasn't worked yet. <laughs> there are some other laws that are just as interesting. Law number 186 admonishes not to eat worms in a fruit once they have left the fruit. Apparently, if you bite into a wormy apple, as long as the worm isn't visible, you're okay. But let that worm poke his head out. Don't you dare eat that. You will be rendered impure. Now, Sandy said I'm, I'm, a, I'm a graduate of Notre Dame as well. It was a difficult night. And there is some question now as to whether Notre Dame can actually play Syracuse next Saturday. Because you see, there is also a law that says, thou shalt not touch the skin of a dead pig. <laughs> we really have to keep these laws in context. Put your not mind now in the, in the perspective of Ezekiel. He's been put down into this valley of bones, these dry bones, strewn in some chaotic abundance throughout the valley. Thigh bones, ankle bones, leg bones. There's a song there. In his mind, if he were to walk among those bones, if he touched them, he risked being in an impure state. The spirit of the Lord is with him, but he is still some cause for alarm. That law, number 443, for every bone that he might touch, seven years impurity. You're not to touch a dead body. Presumably those bones were quite dead. Can you sense his fear? Can you feel his anxiety? As if that isn't bad enough, as he is walking through, being led by the spirit through this valley of dry bones, these bones begin to move themselves. Okay, so now we have two moving objects. That increases his chances, oh my goodness. These bones have responded to Ezekiel's prophesying over them. And they have begun to restore themselves to being decently and in order. Even as terrified as he was of these old dry bones, these bones now moving about, he may be struggling to maintain separation from them. But then wonder of wonder, the bones put themselves together attaching ligaments and tendons to bind bone to bone and muscle to bone. And when all that is finally done, the bodies are tightly packaged up with dermis and epidermis to yield flesh and bones. Quite amazing, but still not living. And then, wonder of wonder, the Lord God calls upon the breath of the four winds to breathe life into them bones the breath of life. Now Ezekiel isn't into this for a lesson in physiology. 
Ezekiel is another one of our prophets who is addressing the condition of the Israelites who have been exiled to Babylon. The Israelites had had displeased God. They had turned away from God. They violated the covenant with God. God used Ezekiel to restore the exiles to hope when they ask if they are to be cut off completely from their God. As the dry bones are restored by the breath of God, so the exiles will be restored by God's breath upon them. While Ezekiel's vision is theologically about the restoration of the people of Israel to God after they have violated the covenant, if we were to dissect this vision, we would see something of a pattern. First, there's the chaos, the disjointed bones throughout the valley, strewn throughout the valley without order or purpose. Then there is the response to that chaos in the fear that was felt by Ezekiel as he imagined being in a perpetual state of impurity. Thirdly, we see the action of God as he reassures Ezekiel by making those bodies whole again. Fourth, we see Ezekiel realizing hope as he begins to understand the power of God. And finally, we see the restoration of life as the breath of God is called from the four winds to resurrect the bones from death back to life. These five things. We can see it in an interesting parable I read about a farmer who had an old mule. Now one day the mule fell into the farmer's well. Chaos. The farmer heard the mule bring And after assessing the situation, the farmer decided that neither the mule was old or the well was almost dry was worth the trouble of saving it. That was his response. Instead, the farmer called his neighbors and friends together, told them what had happened and said, I'm just gonna bury the mule and he enlisted them to help haul dirt and to bury the old mule in the well and put him out of his misery. That was his action. Initially, of course, the mule was pretty hysterical, standing in the bottom of the well and people are throwing dirt on him. But as the neighbors and the farmers continued shoveling, With each shovel full of dirt that hit him on the back, he shook it off, and the dirt fell to the bottom of the well. Shake it off, step up. Shake it off, step up. Pretty soon the the mule had this figured out. He had hope. The old mule fought through it, and you know where this is going. Eventually all the dirt piled up, and the mule was able to step over the edge of the well and walk off. Restoration. What seemed would bury him actually blessed him. The adversities and the obstacles that come along to seemingly hurt us usually have within them the potential to benefit us in some way. Now there comes a time in every sermon when the preacher has to bring it home. How does this message apply to our lives as a church? Our lives as ministers of the church of God. When I choose that term ministers, I'm not speaking of ministers of word and sacrament. That's Quincy. You each individually are ministers within this church. You each have covenanted with God and have been sealed in baptism with him. 
You are ministers of this church. God's church, which you and Pastor Quincy together have pledged responsibility to live into your mission statement. I love this. Transforming people, changing lives. I love the simplicity of that. It conveys so much about the character and integrity of this congregation. Just as Ezekiel confronted the people of Israel with the restoration from hopelessness, I have been active in Presbytery for many years and I have witnessed from afar what you have gone through. I first served with Dick Rogers on the Committee on Ministry. I knew of your co-pastors and your plans and how you had tried to prepare for everything. And then I know of the chaos that ensued. I also know of your response and your actions that testified to the faithfulness of this congregation of, to God and to one another. Your ministries continued and your healing began in earnest. Your hope grew as you transitioned through interim periods and the restoration of the burgeoning life of Westminster. You can see it as you walk into this church. You can feel the life of this church. The notification of study groups, of work groups, of golf outings played without a golf ball. You can feel it. There is a vitality within this church. Ezekiel's vision was about the spiritual hopelessness of the exiles in Babylon and God's promise of restoration of Israel to them. Now we each have our own arid spiritual hopelessness at some times. We can turn on the news and we can see it in the streets of Aleppo. We can see it in the mountains of Kabul, in the deserts of South Sudan in the midnight streets of Chicago, Illinois. And we can see it in the morgues with the sliding gurneys, holding the unfulfilled promise of life of heroin addicts. We can see it in the streets of Munster, Indiana, and Laporte, Indiana, where the homeless sleep wherever they can and where children put themselves to bed wherever they are. We can also see it in our mind's eye looking inward to our soul's dryness as our witness to the kingdom of God sometimes falls short. O oh, mortal, do these bones live? Asks God. Ezekiel responds saying, Oh Lord, you know. Is our spiritual death capable of rising again? We each and every one experience it. Even Mother Teresa, now Saint Teresa, experienced doubt. We are humans, we are imperfect, we are sinful. Yet always God promises us the life everlasting if we be, but accept his grace and allow the living waters to flow through us. If we allow the breath of the Holy Spirit to enter into our chaos, to dictate our responses and our actions, to allow hope to gain a foothold once again. that our spiritual vitality might be restored, that we might continue the work of the kingdom in the ministries to which we have been charged. We Presbyterians devoutly hold to everything must be done, you've heard this, decently and in order. But once in a while, we need to be uncomfortable. Once in a while, we need to be off kilter. We need a bit of chaos to stir things up 
You can pat yourselves on the back for the work you have done for the community of believers and for the community of Munster. But don't become complacent. Go out and find a bit of chaos. All for the good of the kingdom of God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen.